but uh, no, I, I'm happy to be here to talk with everybody. Glad to see everybody's able to come out today on uh, Friday late afternoon evening, and uh, hope you brought plenty of questions for me. See if you can stump the chump up here. If you, yeah, I'm sure there's somebody that's got the answer. If I don't have it, you know, I don't proclaim to put myself on a pedestal or anything. I've learned how to do what I do by making mistakes, not by doing it right all the time. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and I'm blessed to have made that many mistakes because I earn a living at doing that and being out there and plying my trade across North America, and it's allowed me to get better at what I do. You know, I don't proclaim to know everything. You know, I, I have schools for ice fishing. I've been, uh, you know, successful at doing that and getting people to the right areas and, and teaching them. You know, there's guys that come back and back to my ice fishing school and just to learn one more thing every year because there is so much to learn. But I, that's why I have a good pro staff that complements myself and they can take over you know, and, and help people out. So if anybody's ever interested in joining one of our high schools, um, they're getting pretty full right now. There's some room at Saginaw, some room at Cadillac, and some room at uh, up there in uh, Lake Ogiebeek in the western UP. That's will be the first one right there, the 6th to the 9th, and then the 20th through 23rd of January is Mitchell Cadillac, and then Saginaw Bay just before Valentine's Day, 10th to the 13th. So if you're really interested in, in getting out there, because we put the time in, my pro staff and I, at finding the fish prior to the school getting there, so we know what they're biting on. We know where we're going. We know uh, what, uh, you know, to get you there safely and back. You know, if we can't get you to a spot, safely and back we're just not going to bring you there that the key motto to ice fishing in general to me i've been never doing it ever since i've been this big is safety first because i see what happens if you don't use safety out on the ice and now that i mean i used to pride myself if i could get out on my birthday which is december 12th coming up if i could ever get out by that time that was early ice when i was a kid but I had no fear written across my back. Now I took that sign off a long time ago because I seen guys not come back up through the ice too. So I I know what to do and not to do and not and when to go and when not to go. And you know, and having the kind of people that think the way I do surrounding me, we're able to take masses of people out and get them back safe. Uh, so. Just think about the ice school if you ever thought about it, and you, you're going to have 60 years of knowledge you're going to gain in three days. I mean, minimum of that, and it's going to short circuit your learning curve that much. So, and as I talk here tonight, you know, I I need to feed off your questions in order to do a good job because I can just ram stuff right down your throat, and it may not even be anything that you want to hear and we might never get to your question you would leave the door and go geez he didn't even talk about that well i don't know what you want me to talk about i can talk about any facet of of ice fishing so that's why i'm here is to open up your minds on certain it's little things that's going to open up your mind i'm not going to show you anything that you probably haven't done i'm just going to tell you when to do it and how fast to do it and what you're seeing and how to react to what you're seeing and how to use certain types of bait in order to get attention and when you see fish how to get their attention better uh, so that it's there's a lot to ice fishing but you're limited in ice fishing to right here when you're right here you're, you can't be you know drifting across the ice because you can't so when you're fishing and you see fish come below you, whether it's on your underwater cameras or whether it's on your electronics, you have to know and interpret that stuff. If I had a fish without one of them, 
I'd almost feel naked out there on the ice nowadays. I can do it, you can do it, but when you have limited time and everybody's limited, no matter who they are, you want to get fishing, you want to get out there and put yourself where there's fish. If there's no fish, you want to move in about 20 minutes. If there's fish there, you want to know how to react when they come underneath you because if you just sit there and jigging when they're underneath you, yeah, you're probably going to catch a few of them fish but they're gonna keep going a lot of them because they get tired of seeing that thing go up and down. Some of them are finicky and you have to know what you're seeing on your graph when they come in and all of a sudden leave again, you gotta know what to do. You know, if, if somebody here will just say, you're uh, jigging your rod and you know, see a fish come through and you keep jigging it and jigging it. A fish leaves, what do you, what do, you do when a fish leaves? <laughs> When you, you don't see them on your camera, you don't see them on your graph, how do you get that fish to come back in again and again until you can catch them? How do you do that? You know how you, nobody knows how to, see that's one thing you learn in the school. How you doing? And my, and my wife talk, you know, she has never fished fish with anybody but me. She talked a couple outdoor writers into catching their biggest perch of their life last year and some walleyes because she doesn't know anything but what I taught her because she never had anybody tell her anything about fishing. So when she sees something, she just doesn't. She's fishing with an outdoor writer and the outdoor writer goes, oh, look at that one. She goes, yeah, yeah, wiggle your rod. Okay, come on up. Oh, it left. She goes, drop it to the bottom and pound it on the bottom. I mean, that's, I heard her. You know, I was, I was walking and talking with another outdoor writer and, he go, and she goes, there it is, it came back in again. And then it left, she went, pound it on the bottom, Roger. <laughs> and he, he finally got it and it was almost 16 inches long. <laughs> you know, so, and, I, and, and we do that for walleye, we do it for bluegills, we do it for a lot of different kinds of fish. When the fish leave, I don't know what it is, whether they feel it, whether they think it got hurt, but they sense that their ears which is their lateral line, picks up the slut, subtlest little moves. And I think something flopping on the bottom must give off a different type of tone or feel, and they think it's hurt. And they come rushing right back in to see what, what's going on. Whoa. And they'll come right over. Or you, 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 let's say you miss a fish. You know, if you, if you miss a fish, it's the same thing. You, 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 you what, the problem I have, is it took me a long time too. I set the hook on it, miss that fish. Maybe you felt him for a second and he, he's gone. Everybody just reels right back up to see if they're, how their bait looks, right? The worst thing in the world. The worst thing that you possibly can do. Because now if you don't have any bait, you just took the rest of the presentation away from that fish because he got that piece of bait. And he's hungry for the rest of it. He's going, I missed it. Man, that little piece I got. Well, the first thing you, you do when you realize it is free spool it right to the bottom again. Bottom contact is going to be your friend all during the winter here. Boom, right on the bottom, pound it on the bottom and just barely pick it up. And they think they wounded it. Wham, they come right back in and they grab it. Or you just start lifting it up as they come in and they'll grab it. You know, it's not a guaranteed every time it happens, but I can guarantee you when you got it sitting up here and you're rebaiting it, the chances of catch, getting it back down to catch that fish that you just missed, there it's already over that way, 20 feet, 100 feet, whatever. So remember, if you miss a fish, get it back onto the bottom, pound it, get those fish's attention, and they'll come right back in. And if you can't, if you swim away again, even though you don't know if you have bait or not, pound it on the bottom some more and, and get them to come in as soon as you don't see them for a little while. Now it's time to check your bait. Now is time. So make sure, you know, never reel up or anything like that. Anybody have any questions over the brief little synopsis I gave everybody here, you know, there's got to be somebody with a question they're dying to ask me on top of it. Anybody? Come on, somebody's got one. 
<laughs> so you can do this because you have electronics though, right? Right, but you, you don't. Well, if you feel it and you missed it, do the same thing. you pop right out on the bottom. You, with without electronics, you don't need electronics when you, oh, I missed them, and pull it back out of the bottom, pick it up, and feel like, hey, <clears throat> oh, there it is, right there. How long are you usually pounding on the bottom before you look? Oh, you're waiting two seconds. Back, yeah? One, two, three, about three seconds. Okay, don't, it, don't just keep doing it until he comes no, back. No, just pound it on the bottom, bum, 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 pop, and then pop it up about that far. Or that far, you know, some where you got some kind of distance, even that far. You know, a lot of times they'll come in when I wash them on the camera. Sometimes when I'm pounding on the bottom, they turn around so fast they got it before I even, you know, I set the hook because I seen they, they got it. They just suck up the mud to get it because, you know, they want it so bad. And uh, how many of you use cameras here? Anybody use cameras? Okay, I mean, you, you can, there's a lot of different ways that you can use cameras to, you know, and I, a lot of times I carry, um, you know, real thick wire with me too, um, you know, it's, and I peel off all the plastic off the, the outside of it so you can bend it, you know, and, and I, you mean have single it, strand wire, you mean? No, I mean real. I don't know what it is, 10 gauge, I don't know, I mean, or whatever, it's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> something that you can bend and it'll tilt your camera how you want it. Oh. You know, so you, 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 you fix it to your, from your camera up the line about so far. So now you can take and bend that camera at an angle. So now we'll just say you got two choices, either be at the level of where the fish is straight looking right them in the eye which they don't like very much you know you can get a distance back if the water's clear and that's not so bad <clears throat> but it, you know most of the time you don't have super good clarity so you're kind of invasive of them and I've learned that that's what you got to have that's what you got to have but what I started to do was put that copper wire on there he well, you painted tape, it. tape it on the, the yeah, electrical tape. Oh, okay. And then you just tilt it down a little bit, however you want it. So instead of being sitting straight, you can take the wire and <laughs> bend it back and then put it down. So now you're above them, but you're off to the side. Instead of right on top of them and just getting a back profile, you're kind of getting a side profile and it's not invasive in their space. It, oh. It's above them. Little tricks, you know, it's just little things that I help my students and outdoor writers understand. And I'm surprised none of the outdoor writers have written about it because, uh, you know, a lot of the people after I show them that, they end up just using their camera because they go, wow, this is cool. You know, now I can stay above them, not be invasive in their space. But I like to use both in combination. The reason I like to use both is because let's say where's the only uh, i troll in the winter time but you know how you troll Throw this way <laughs> and that way that's the way you troll <laughs> you know <laughs> and and that's when you bring a fish in and he hasn't bit and you pound it on the bottom because he went away and you brought him back in and you know after a while you got to start doing something different and it's got to be um, you got to mix it up. You got to mix it up. You can't be doing the same thing over and over. So I came back in again. Oh, geez, I, if I do it too many times on the bottom, he's just going to go away and never come back. So now let's get his interest and just start reeling and jiggling and reeling and jiggling and reeling and jigging and reeling and jigging real slow. And you're coming trolling up and it's coming right with you. I'm not kidding you. A lot of times in 40 some feet of water, when I'm walleye fishing, I brought them up to within probably four feet of the bottom of the ice. And that's where they hit. And I broke my rod because I set the hook, snapped it. <laughs> you know, you know, I was like, it's coming, it's coming. But if I just had the camera down there, I don't know that, you know, I don't, I wouldn't know where it was once I got out of the camera angle. But with the, the fish finder, I'm able to bring it up and up because it's always going to be there. And I can see when it breaks off, that's when I drop 
the lure back onto the bottom, even if it's 30 feet below, they'll come right back in after it and pound it on the bottom and, and then you start it all over again. I had Gabe from Michigan Outdoors years ago and we were just smoking the big ones on Little Bait and Knock and I brought so many of them up within four to ten feet out of forty feet of water. We caught them but that's when the one I broke my rod and I still got the fish. It, you know, every, this pole is about that big after that but <laughs> fish I got that one at about eight pounds. But he couldn't believe that I could do that so many times and then bring them up that high out of, out of their environment. Because this is a little change in temperature, I, you know, from there to there. I mean, it's just very little, but it's pretty extreme because it's almost like freezing once you get up below the ice and down there it might be a degree or two warmer at the bottom. So, you know, it, you, that's extreme for a fish. So to bring them up that far, you can do it, but everything has, you can't let it really sit in one position as you do it, you just gotta keep going and they'll come right in and wham! You know, and if they don't and they go away, that's where your electronics picks them up, you immediately go back to the bottom. I don't care what type of lure you're using, it has to go back to the bottom so that you can get their attention again. You know, and I, I've been using the, probably the last five years a lot of plastics, a lot of gulp, a lot of um, you know set impregnated plastics. It, I my eyes got even though I had the opportunity to do it well before that. Really, one of my students opened my eyes. You know, and you know I, I can learn from anybody. I don't say I'm better than anybody. I don't say I know more than somebody. Well, this particular student, we got all the way out there, and my sponsors, they, they give you a pretty gracious tackle package. Sometimes six, you, you pay $475 for the class, you get $600 worth of stuff. You know, and he got an insulated bait, but plain old bait bucket, but he had one. You know, so he went and got minnows for uh, you know, the school same kind as he had. Well, he grabbed the wrong one that was empty and put in his ice shanty, but he also got little gulp minnows in the jar. And he, he goes, and he was like, I, I, I screwed up, Mark. No, I don't want your bait. I don't want the, anybody else's bait. You gave us this stuff. It's supposed to work. I'm going <laughs> to use it. He caught his limit by 10 o'clock in the morning and, and, and with nothing but the little golf minnows on there. And it got to be, by the third day, it got to be where people quit using live bait because it was <coughs> harder and more messy and your hands got cold. And finally got to the point where we were catching so many walleyes and smallmouth and northerns and catfish and everything like that, people went to a bear Jigging Rapala, a bear Northland Spoon, a bear Cleo, a bear, everything was bear, but they also got a little jug of scent gulp, and some of them got some other kind of spray too. They just sprayed it on their lure, put it down there, and they were catching them as well as they just as good as they had live bait. You know, so I seen firsthand that scent is not a negative thing. If anything, it's neutral. It's not negative. It, it'll always bring you up, maybe up here sometimes, maybe just a little bit. But it's never going to take away from what you're doing. <coughs> it's going to be a plus. The plastics are, you know, really coming in for ice fishing. People, it opened up the whole class's eyes, including mine, including my pro staff, including some of the outdoor writers that had experience at ice fishing. It was, it was amazing, you know, and now, Every place we go, we catch fish on, on plastics in the winter time. We use all different kinds of plastics, from little grubs to minnows. What determines your choice of bait where you're fishing? It depends on what we're fishing for. You know, I, if I'm fishing walleyes or northern, or you know, if there's uh, bass, sometimes they're in the same area. Those type of fish want a minnow, you know, type bait. 
you know, on the end of your presentation. If it's crappies, you know, something that go to a real small little rubber body minnow or some type of little rat pinky type thing. Bluegills, the same thing. Bluegills, they like the little grubs. And you just, the one thing you want to remember about plastic too, it's not live bait. So how do you keep plastic looking alive? You know, it's the way you hook it and you got to keep moving it. So it's not something that you go, you know, put underneath a bobber and let it sit there like it's a corn borer or wax worm or spike or something like that. It, it's not going to, you know, it's, you gonna catch, you can't, I can't say you can't catch it. You're not going to catch as many, but you just keep wiggling it. Your wiggle may, you know, if you're wiggling it, attracting them in like that, and you let it sit, your wiggle may turn into just a little wiggle like that. Just a little tiny wiggle, not a, you know, a super wiggle. The walleye, you're going to go live bait. Not, not, no, no, I can't say I'll go live bait, because last year in Gogebe, when we were testing this, this out, one of the outdoor writers had been with us on, on Saginaw Bay when we were using nothing but plastic. He went right to plastic. He caught more walleyes than anybody with, with live bait. Way more. You know, I, he, he, Bill Simeon. I don't know you think that's read Bill the, Simeon stuff. You think that's because of the scent that's in it? I think it's because of the scent. And, and a lot of times, you know, that's all you're going to get out of a minnow, too. You got them hooked in the lips or hooked in the head, you know, and it, it's, it's, that's what you got too. It's a, it, it's not, it's not swimming around. Or it's not, not a, you know, you got them pegged pretty hard. Uh, you know, I mean, you might get a little wiggle like that out of a, a minnow, you know, but it's going to be a piece of meat mm -hmm. and you're going to, and it's got the scent right there. But even, I, even so, even if I have live bait, doesn't matter if I have spikes, I got wax worms, I got minnows, I'm still spraying scent on them. Because I think, you know, some people have more stinkum on their hands, even if they put live bait on. It's kind of like deer hunting, it's a, it's a cover scent. It, it, it does one of two things, it's a tractor, it's a cover scent. And, you know, and so if you believe in it for deer hunting, then why wouldn't you do it when you got it? something that close that can pick up just as much in the water you know little molecules per million and if you got stinky on your hands they don't like that maybe all that it takes it you don't catch a fish or don't do as well today or tomorrow or whenever so I I'm, I'm anal about my hunting I'm anal about my fishing but I've done it ever since I've been just a little tiny boy and like I say, I made mistakes, but when I start using things and being anal, I, I find out I do better. But being anal means that you, it t it's more time consuming. People want instant gratification all the time. And, and it's really setting yourself up for failure or success. You know, scent will always elevate your game. Moving at the, the right speed is, is gonna elevate your game when you see a fish disappear and doing it immediately, it can't be, oh, the fish went away. That's too slow. If you can't do it in a tenth of a second, if you can't realize that fish left or you got a bite and you missed it and you can't just go boom like that and let it go to the bottom, it's, you're just not gonna do it anyhow. I mean, just because you put it at the bottom, that fish is too far away to react to it. It's gotta be when that fish is within a circle like that, that you can still bring them back in. And, and like maybe I brought them up 30 feet and they, they would blow off the side, but I would open up my bale and let it plummet and they could feel it going down and then when it hit the bottom, so it, they knew it was coming by them. <coughs> it, was, it, was, it passed them up and they seen it and now they're, they're headed for it. So you, if you react quick enough, they're gonna react quick enough. It's not going to work for every single one, but you're going to find out, you know, and, I, you know, and, and I'll find out because somebody in here will say, hey, Mark, it worked, or they're going to email me or send me some pictures. And that's what does my heart good. You know, that's what keeps me going today is you people out here telling me they read something in my articles and go, man, you tell the truth. I have no reason why 
to lie to anybody. My my pro friends get upset with me when I do seminars because I tell you everything. And by telling you everything, you can't remember everything. <laughs> or you mix it up. You know, but I'm truthful with you the whole way. And you know, that's why I sell books. I brought five books each in up there. You can buy them when we're done and I'll autograph them. I got some videotapes and it's got ice fishing in one of the books up there and everything that I'm talking about is in there with diagrams and pictures and everything. So, you know, I, I, I can't, nobody lied to me that I know of when I was a kid. And I talked with people all the time. And that's how I learned too. I talked to somebody I see that's more successful. And when I was a kid, you could get away with it. You know, they'd show <laughs> you, you know. And, and uh, you know, I was, I was blessed to, you know, have a family that took me fishing. I was blessed that, uh, um, you know, I, I, I cut my teeth on night fishing. And then I was doing, like, the first guy to do seminars on night fishing. You know, up in Muskegon Lake catching these hogs. You, know, you guys got them down here, left and right. And, and when I was doing a seminar one time, Gary Roach was there back when I was young. And he was fascinated with what I was talking about. And we got to be, and that was over here at Bassarama when Bassarama was just Bassarama. You know, so everybody knows how many years ago that was, <laughs> 30 years ago. At least, yeah, you know, and, like that. and and that's when Gary and I struck up a fast friendship, and we became uh, business partners, and and that's really, you know, you need somebody that's better than you, or you feel it's better than you to go fishing with, because that way you can see what they're doing, and they learn from you too, you know. That's the secret is always go fishing with people that are better with than you, or you feel that is, because you're gonna glean things from them. And, and you know, I was always, am I doing this right? You're always, don't, doesn't everybody kind of second guess yourself? If, are you doing it right? <laughs> right, right, I mean, if you're not, you're not human. Well, when you surround yourself with so many people that are, that do things right and they all we you learn from each other then you know i started oh geez i kind of fish like the, you know and so if they're not biting it's not because you're doing it wrong now it's because a lot of times if you if you're not catching fish you take that method and start doing something that's stupid with it and then you catch a fish that's the worst thing is if you catch a fish doing something <laughs> wrong and now you're you just took 10 years back because now you just think you did it right and it wasn't it just was an accident yeah one time thing you know where you caught a fish on a clothespin i mean yeah that type of thing so you you got to understand you fish with better people and so i i got to fish with al linder hundreds of times i dave sanda you know you know, Ron Linder's brother, and Sarah, I mean, all these people that everybody here knows as icons. And we, and I started to realize that, geez, you know, there's only one or a little bit of variance of that method, and one or a little variance of that method, or one or a little variance of that method. You, you realize when, if you're gonna change a, a method that much, you might as well get a new method out and try it. And that's what I realized and how to get better at fishing. Instead of say, hey, using a jig and wrap, I put on a spoon. Instead of using a spoon, I might go just a split shot and a hook and a minnow swimming around. It, it's, it's, that's what you're changing. You're not doing crazy things with your, with your presentations. You're just changing your presentations. And that's what I learned by fishing with the best of the best. And, I am part of all of them people, and they glean from me because I take them night fishing and show them how to do the night fishing thing. And there's a tape of Al Linder and I out there somewhere that is pretty cool if you ever can get your hands on it. I got one of my night tapes back here. Um, I hate to get away from ice fishing, but it's just a fun story. I was fishing the PWT out at Putin Bay in Lake Erie. 
And uh, Al says, man, we, have, I, we keep threatening to go do a show with you for night fishing. What do you think you can do on here today? I said, yeah, no problem. He goes, well, then we're going to have to get everything unhooked, and we got to take the ferry back, and we've got to go out by Davis Bessie Power Plant, and we got to fish all these humps out here. And I'm like, what do we got to do that for, Al? My boat's in right here. I says, why don't you go get your camera, get Jimmy. I says, we'll take off some seats and we'll put a cooler in there and we'll go out fishing right there off of Rattlesnake Island right there and we'll have all the walleyes we want. He goes, wow, you've been practicing, huh? He says, no, haven't done a thing. He goes, well, how do you know they're gonna bite out there? I go, well, because I caught a whole bunch of fish in the daytime trolling suspended out there in the deep water. Wow. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, he, he, he had his mind over there, and yeah, you, it, you know, but the thing is, you got to remember at night, they all come in the shore, the majority of them, that's where they feed, or a long point that goes from shore out, or a big island like Rattlesnake where it comes up, it, you know, reefs out in the middle of nowhere, you know, they, they're hit and miss, you got, you don't know which one they could be on or not on, because they've pulled back towards these type of locations. And I told Al, I said, okay. He says, uh, what are we gonna use? I said, number 13 floating rapples, three number seven split shot. I tie it up for him and put it on. And we started motoring towards Rattlesnake to the tip and it came out right here. And I said, okay, put it out 85 feet. He goes, <laughs> ploosh. I go, oh, okay. If that's the way he's going to do it, you know. I went, shh, shh, shh. I watch my counter click 85. I go, whoa, there's one right there on the graph. I says, I said, oh, and then I look behind me. I go, Al, Al, we don't have very much longer to catch fish. As soon as that moon gets right about there, it's going to be lights out. We're not going to catch no more fish. That went in that ear and out that ear. And these and I we got up just far enough, boom, nine pounder I get. Didn't go another got that one on video. Didn't go another fifty yards and I had another one close to the same size. Now Al's going. You got a measure board in here? <laughs> well yeah, right there, Al why? He goes, Well, uh, let's see that. Uh, one foot right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, he's right into one. He's like, whoa, you got to be that precise, huh? They go, well, you know, that was before people paid attention to counter reels and, and did all that. That was, you know, people just put stuff out and they haphazardly caught fish back in those days. So then he was like impressed. So we finally made it all way around Rattlesnake Island, almost all the way around, because we were catching fish so often. And then the moon got right there, and we kept going. We were about more than three quarters of the way around again, didn't get another bite, didn't get another fish. He says, let's reel in, Jimmy. Mark, reel in. We caught enough fish. He goes, go around the other side where it's calm. We got a lot of talking to do. He says, Fishing, I thought, was going to be the best thing. He says, the information you got up there in that head, he says, I believe everything you say right now. He says, where did you learn all that? I said, from my grandpa and dad. And I said, I felt the same way when I was that high when they kept telling me when the moon got here, it went in here and came out here. And after so many times of it happening, it got to be gospel. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. It just does, you know? And if you pay attention to that, no matter what you do, you're gonna be successful at night. I don't know what kind of gravitational pull. And he goes, well, why do we do this? And why do we? And so if you ever get your hands on that tape, which is a rarity nowadays, they, it's out there. It's a good one for people to watch. And you, it'll help you if you're a night fisherman. And I've used the same thing right here in the Detroit River when everybody's hand lining out here. I'm the only one, well back then I was the only one trolling right next to shore 
with three number seven split shots and a number 13 Rapala, and I can't keep them off, and the people out there hand lining can't even catch one hardly. You know, and they're, what do they do at night around these lights and docks and everything? So I was weaving in around the docks and lights and catch, 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 catch. You know, I went with different people, and they're like, wow, I don't want to do this anymore. This is too easy like this. Just put it out, no weight on it, and just slowly tick up the river, barely moving. So, but back to ice fishing. There's got to be a question here that somebody wants to ask. Now. Back to your ice fishing as far as time of day. Do you yeah. have a preference? No. No. I don't have, even early in the morning, late in the evening is good, but it doesn't matter at high noon, you can still catch fish if you put yourself in the areas. And I'm going to tell you, because you asked the question, it pulls things out of my little mind up here, how I react in the middle of the day. They don't always stay right where they should, like they'll move in and then they move out. The later in the season, they seldom move in very much anymore. A lot of times, they'll just stay out until the last bit, and then they'll move in. So remember, you're just going to have to go out. Maybe if they're in on a 20-foot break, or they were in on an 8, 9-foot break, or they're right next to the weeds in the morning, it's noon. Nothing's happening. I've moved all over the place. I mean, one here, one there. I see fish. I, you know, nothing. Move way out. Don't be afraid. If the the maximum depth in the lake is 50, 60 feet, go out there. They go out to that deep water, and then they, they they're susceptible to being caught out there too. And once you find them out there, they'll be just as the best bite you have up here. And that in the late in the season. They hardly, that's where you're going to find them most of the time. That's why a lot of perch fishermen catch them on their perch rigs and everything in the deeper parts of the lake because they stay out, out there at that time of the year. And I think they're eating some of the perch too, you know, because they're getting their eggs and melt developed. Uh, so that makes a big difference right there. But, uh, you know, to me, uh, being mobile, is, is part of it, and then knowing when to move. I, I'd give myself a half hour, 20 minutes in a spot without seeing something. Sometimes my move might only be from here to that corner right there, or sometimes my move's gonna be a mile and a half. Depends on the body of water and how far I, I anticipate, you know, by looking at my, oh, I didn't bring my, I should've grabbed my phone. I got the uh, Navionics app on it, and I could have brought Lake St. Clair right up on it, and I have all my contours on it, tells me where I am. It's my little GPS in my pocket, is my smartphone. And you can download those apps off of the, um, and here you'd probably want the Canadian American one. I think it's like $14.99 or something like that. And I tell you what, it's, you know, if you don't have a GPS, if you have a smartphone, now you got a GPS for $14.99. And it'll show you right where you are, and you can drive right to the contour, put it back in your pocket, and you know you're right there. A couple holes you might have to drill to find out if you're exactly there or not. But I tell you, that little app has, uh, I, I give my phone to some people that don't, and they go and find it, and then by a little while later, I'll catch up to them and get it back. You know, you can. You, it's it's a cool little thing. You know, if you got how many of you have smartphones here? How many of you have Navionics apps in them? What do you guys think about it? Must have you can buy it for fourteen bucks. Yeah, for fourteen bucks, it's it's a good thing to have, isn't it? You know, it, it is. It's it's a little app you download, and you're gonna. Be real happy about that. How does that cover Lake Erie? The Canadian side of Lake yep. Erie too. If you get Canadian American, okay. if you just get the U.S., you, right. know, you won't even know Canada exists out there. Cool. So instead of for nine ninety nine, you get U.S. only all the lakes in the U.S. For you know fourteen ninety nine, you get all the lakes in right. Canada and the United States combined, and you can go anywhere you want. What about uh, tip-ups? Do you ever uh, use tip-ups all the time? Oh, yeah. You use tip-ups all the time. In fact, our first uh, place we're going on, Lake Gogebic, it's going to be a riot, let me tell you. 
when, when it gets about 4 o'clock, I mean, you're going to be catching fish all day long. 4 o'clock, you're going to have a hard time keeping your tip-ups in the water. The walleyes move into the cabbage weeds and 10 feet away. It's kind of just like Lake St. Clair here. <laughs> you, you guys probably, I mean, I've never ice fished out here. I've fished open water, but you guys got cabbage and coontail. I'm sure of that out here. 8, eight 10, 12 feet of water. You, you, you guys go fish around the edges of that ever out here? Uh, early fish. season. Just yeah. to fish through the ice in front of Memorial Park. But, uh, right in the edge of the weeds. Uh, well, 10, 11, 12 foot of water. But, yeah. uh, the last few years, the ice hasn't been good enough to get out of Right. And then again, down in front of uh, <coughs> uh, just the side of Forge Cove, down by Nine Mile. Yeah. Uh, we've gone out there on what, we, what I call the mobiles, which is what we call pumps. Yeah. I've had drag tails back to the <laughs> full walleyes, but uh, that has, that's been a long time ago since we've done that. Yeah, that, the, 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 the winters haven't years. been conducive no, to that, no. it, as you know, because there's a lot of current coming through this by the water. But you know, the cabbage and coontail out here, when you're able to get out there early season, whenever that may be, and hopefully it's when the weeds are still alive. <laughs> um, you know that's where you're going to really want to look and, and if you got a camera what you want to do in the weeds is you put it drill a hole oh right there's cabbage it's green it's standing up oh man i'm right in the middle of it oh i got to go over there it looks like an edge go drill another hole put it over there then you can find the, the exact edge or an open pocket and that's right where you want to sit right there is you want to sit in that open pocket right there or on the edge because they'll travel that edge, especially right, right. This is, lake would be a classic great thing. You know, if you could depend on it having ice, I'd have a school down here in a heartbeat because it'd be such a fish factory. And you could teach people how, because there's enough fish to teach people on. But uh, tip up fishing, I, I strongly recommend when the people come with me for the first one or anytime I ice fish is get lights for your tip-ups. You want lights for your tip-ups because the whole, when I fished last year with the outdoor raid, it looked like Christmas out there. There's lights sticking up all over and you went from one to another to another. You turn around and them are up behind you. I mean, it was that fast. And the thing is, you know, I'm gonna ask a question here and don't think I'm picking on anybody because I've done the same stupid things. You know, and, and when I hook a minnow, I do it a certain way when I have it under a tip up. You know, which which way, you know, anybody want to say how they hook their minnow? Yeah. The top of the dorsal. In the top of the dorsal. Anybody else got any other ideas under a tip up? Tail. In the tail? Both lips. Or Both lips. You know, none of them are a, 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 a bad way. And I used to always put it right in the dorsal, and then the, fit, the minnow would sit there like this, and he's like, he'd go to sleep. <laughs> he's like, wow, this is kind of nice. It doesn't hurt no more. He says, I don't have to swim. I'm upright. And that's the thing is, they don't have to swim. But somebody said in the tail, I hook it right between the tail and the dorsal fin so that when he quits swimming, he starts to tip down. They don't like to tip down. And then they start swimming again, and then he gets tired of swimming, and then he tips down. Don't like to sit, tip down, so he's working all the time. Are these minnows are like little suckers in these walleye? Suckers, minnows, it don't matter. Just, you know, sometimes I, I'm out there and I catch a minnow that's native to the lake, and I'll put that one on. You know, I catch a little trout perch, or sometimes I catch a, a natural shiner, and sometimes... You know, I catch some kind of bait that's legal to put on. I think it isn't it. Can you hook a perch on now? Perch, blue yeah, blue yeah, bait. blue yellow. Yeah, if you caught it out of that body of water, yeah. you can put it on your tip. But yeah, usually, you couldn't do that. Yeah, over your limit of perch. Yeah, over your limit of yeah, over your limit of bluegills <laughs> or perch, you better not. Yeah. <laughs> you ever try hooking them upside down? Yeah, you you could. And it probably work, but the thing's gonna, it's gonna struggle so much, it's gonna kill itself in short order. Yeah, I've tried it. And, and they, they struggle like crazy. And yeah, I've caught fish doing that. 
but the middle usually where unless the fish are real active and there's a lot of fish around there's a lot of fish around it's a great way it would work great because something's going to hit it quickly but if it's got to sit there a while it's not yeah, it's going to yeah right it's going to be so exhausted if, and then it'll drown if you're walleye if you're, if you're turning walleye you're talking about three putting that minnow off the bottom like how far foot is it about is it time of day matter or, or yeah never very far off the bottom I mean, like for northerns you're halfway up <coughs> at least maybe even further than halfway up and you think you'd do that for walleyes you know i've tried that to, you know thinking that they like it you know from bottom up that far maybe that far. you know you, you experiment but i wouldn't go any further than that off the bottom for continued success not with a tip up you ever yeah. try those wind tip ups yep yep them wind tip ups are good too you know, and that, that'd be like, you know, it keeps your bait moving, yeah. you know, I mean, so if you got wind tip ups, you could hook them right through the dorsal and it's going to make them jerk on them and make them swim. But if you don't have one of them, hooking them between the dorsal and the tail yeah. is going to make it, you know, make the same thing happen to them. Somebody had a question back there that I didn't get to. I know that somebody did. You? What's your take on the underwater lights? <laughs> underwater lights? Yeah. If they're there forever and ever, or there every night, you know, I mean, smelt them, you know, and they don't have to be there every night, but, you know, I, I guess I'm not sold on it. I, you know, it's something that's not natural, and, you know, it's like out here, you know, and maybe you can relate to what I'm saying, but the ones that are established lights that are by docks out here in the river, are more popular with the fish and if you stuck up a new light it's not going to be as good as the established light not for a while anybody agree or disagree with that it's not going to be something that as soon as you stick a light out there you're going to start catching fish you know and it's kind of invasive at first because it's not it, they don't have a big brain but they're not you know they're they're cautious that's how they've got big and that's you know if they're not cautious and rush into things they they die you know so you're the only ones you got left that are they are smart ones you know you hope so anyhow <laughs> but yes what kind of line do you use uh, when you're jigging rain fluorocarbon i use all of it um you know i i personally like fluorocarbon myself because sometimes the fish have to come up and they look at your bait and you know and you got to come up and go down on a spinning and, reel yeah spinning reel i got little bitty level lines too but i like my spinning reel the, the best do you use a uh, little barrel swivel little tiny not a barrel swivel a ball bearing so i'm glad you brought that up because in high school i lay my fishing rod out no matter what i have for whether it's a spoon any of these right here, <clears throat> jig and wraps, they have all these spoons over there on the wall, got a pretty good price on these for, I couldn't believe it, with the, the kicking minnow over there, like wow, unbelievable, but uh, all these will twist your line up, every one of them, and if you use a, a just a, a swivel, they're going to twist your line up anyhow too a ball bearing high quality swivel you're going to spend a couple bucks on a swivel small one you're going to have a leader about that fire and a small cross lock snap you guys got cross lock snaps and little ball cool. bearing swivels yeah. we can show everybody after and and that's really what you want the smallest ones you want the black ones and that silver i mean you use whatever you want but you, ball bearing swivels keep your line from twisting up and the cross lock is, is light enough that it's not going to inhibit the action of that lure at all. Instant people, and I'll hand my pole right down on the table, I'll just put it down here and my pro staff will put their poles down in front of everybody on the next table and another pro staff. They're all, all the rods are rigged the same. 
with a cross lock snap, a ball bearing swivel about that far up, and a lure. We don't care about the lure because they're going to be changing anyhow. We just want to make sure you got the cross lock snap, a small one, and a small ball bearing swivel. The cross lock's on the lure? Cross lock is on the lure. Not a snap swivel, and that's where people make the biggest mistake <laughs> is put a snap swivel, instead of having the swivel here and, and have the snap here, they got the snap swivel right down on the lure. No, I got tie one knot. <laughs> and it's so much easier, they said. And they got it done so much quicker. I, that's why I say I'm anal. I take it apart and I put one here, one there. You know, I, but I know better because it takes that lure that the manufacturer made and changes that lure completely. It makes that lure do something that manufacturer never intended it to do. Not saying you can't catch a fish, but you're not going to catch the same amount of fish as he is when he's doing it right. You're not going to get the same amount of strikes as he is that he's doing it right. So we got all these poles laid out. Not that you know, don't can, you know, I, it just gives me an insight, and I don't criticize anybody because I used to do that too. I come back, the pole's been sitting on, and everybody's passed around on that table here. They got through tying. Inevitably, there'll be a couple people that got a snap swivel right at the end. Because it was easier. <laughs> or they got a great big one like that and a great big snap on it. And I'm going, what are you going to do? Go marlin fishing with me? <laughs> like, what? And what? Oh, it was so much easier for me to see. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's not we're not trying to do things easy here you know fishing isn't easy fishing gives me headaches fishing is <laughs> tough fishing is something that you got to apply yourself at fishing is something you better do everything right to be the best you can be every day you go and if you can make that lure look like the manufacturer wanted it you're going to be that far ahead what action uh, rod do you use? Like a medium, medium, heavy? Depending on the lure. The lure that I'm using, like this one right here, you know, I, I couldn't use too big of a lure. Otherwise, it's going to be like this all the time when the lure's hanging there. I'd have to go and get a little bit bigger, you know, like this one right here. You 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 don't want you you might want a little slight bend in it like that in your when you got your presentation on it. These are all fast tip. They're nice rods. I like these rods sensitive. They sell them right over here. It's great. They're excellent. I, I, as soon as I picked it up, I knew I could really whale on some fish. But you don't want your lures hanging so they're like this on any rod. Whether you're jigging in the Detroit River with six foot rods or seven footers or whatever. You want, when you're using, you've been using a medium heavy usually in the Detroit River jigging, but when the ice lures, you don't want your rod bent like that either. You want it so it's just maybe slightly bent like that so that you, you can feel it. So when you set the hook, you know, right now it's like you got a fish on even though you got just your jigging spoon on there. You want something that when the fish hits, you want that tip to maybe, you're holding it right there and jigging it and you stop for a second and it just bends it. You don't want it so stiff that when the, before, you, can, you, you can't even see it, and the fish feels you and lets it go. But if it's a slight bend to it and you just hold it there, you can see it bend a little bit more. If you can't bend it a little bit more with the weight you have on it, you, you need to go to a lighter one. You want to use the lightest, fastest action tip as you possibly can. But, you don't want to be so light that it's bent, okay? So every lure that you have, so it's kind of like summertime fishing. There's not one rod that works for every presentation you have. It's sad, isn't it? Like, you could just put your snap swivel at the end and get it over with. You have one rod that you could be over with. It just isn't that easy, you know? It isn't, you know? I mean, I, I try, you know, working with people and, and telling them that, you know, and you know some people a lot most of them get it after the third day of the school they all get it you know i go out there and i'll fish with my buddy right here and i'll go hey what are you doing well let's see you in your ride 
he had it all rigged up when we ended the class the first day and I go out there at the first day, noon, and he's got a big marlin swivel on it and I'm like, oh, oh, what are you doing? Well, uh, you know, I don't know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to change that while I'm right here. <laughs> you know, my fingers got cold after a while, and it was hard to move that little tiny swivel. Well, it just warm your hands up a little bit, and if it takes a little while if to get that right presentation back on again, then it takes a little while. Everything has to be right. You know, and I, and I don't, I understand. But I also understand to be successful, what you have to do too. You know, what determines your hook set? I mean, what how, what determines my hook set? You know, as far as how hard do I set the hook or when? I mean, the first tap. Oh, it's the first tap. I mean, I I don't give them. I mean, as soon as I I'm, I'm jigging or just say like that, and I pound it in the mud to bring them back, and I pick it up and I just see go. Oh, I mean, it's right now. And, and people they, in the camera sometimes, I, a lot of times I, I'm not even fishing. I'm fishing to show people, and then I get the, the students out there, and the cameras are in, and I, I, I turn into the, I, I, I can I watch their graph, and I'm going, okay, 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 do this, do this, do this, pound it on bottom, come on, come on, come on, pick it up, pick it up. All of a sudden I see their, I see their pole go, oh, I say, set the hook before they even know it. And they got the fish. I go real, real, real. I don't know if anybody's ever seen me on, on doing ice shows, but I just make you real. And most people go, oh, and, Ooh, let's play with this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, he got off. Or he's running all around. By the time he gets to the top of the hole, he gets hooked on the hole. You know how you land 99.9% .9 of your fish in the winter time. I don't care how big they are, how small they are. You know what you do? You set the hook.